um, program, which was um, which was started, uh, you know, three years back with the intent to bring in new fresh talent into the sec uh, sector to complement the talent that already exists. So this is a program that uh, we run with senior executives, largely from the corporate sector, who would like to come into the development sector, have a second career, make a meaningful impact, and do it in an informed and meaningful way. So, uh, you know, we help build perspective around the sector and also handhold people as they make those transitions. Um, ILSS Online is our second offering, and I think many of you might have attended some of these sessions with us. Um, the genesis of the ILSS Online series was uh, really the pandemic last year, where we thought that we wanted to create uh, additional spaces to talk about uh, issues that uh, were coming up to start making meaning together as a community of all the challenges that uh, you know were emerging going to the pandemic. And since then, it has evolved into a larger platform for us to talk about development issues across the board. And as you might see from the list of speakers on this slide, uh, we've covered everything from health, gender, nutrition, um, environment, climate change, across the board. So do... Um, check out our website for any up upcoming sessions in the ILSS online series. And today we're here for a session that's part of the ILSS fundraising program. Uh, so this is very exciting because uh, we are only in the second edition of our ILSS fundraising program. And uh, it started as uh, you know, our very ambitious in, uh, uh, intent to create the country's first comprehensive fundraising program for professionals to really uh, you know, get the skills, the com confidence and competencies uh, that they needed to be able to raise funds and amplify the impact of their own organization. Uh, so we already have, uh, you know, an alumni base of 50 people, 35 people who are in our current cohort of the program uh, working with us. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you enjoy today's session, uh, do go to the website uh, because applications are open for the next uh, edition of the fundraising program starting this, this September. And finally, coming to today's session, we have with us Motushi Sen Gupta. And like I said, Motushi is Director of India at the MacArthur Foundation. And she brings rich experience of more than 26 years in uh, the development sector. Um, over her career, she has worked with several organizations and uh, teams across cultures. Uh, and her focus really has been uh, on working with systems how to ensure lasting and systemic change uh, in the various domains. We'll understand, of course, from her about the approach at MacArthur Foundation currently, the areas of interest and so on. Uh, but uh, interestingly, and which I did not know before reading this bio, Motushi is also a, a certified coach with the ICF. So uh, welcome, Motushi. We're looking forward to having an interesting conversation with you uh, today. Um, yes, yeah, whichever we can stop the screen share, please. Thank you. Um, and uh, to talk a little bit about what we're hoping to cover in the session itself, I think there's a few different uh, themes. One is, of course, uh, you know, since we have the luxury of time with Motishi today, we'd love to deep dive into uh, MacArthur's foundation, uh, MacArthur Foundation's work, uh, just to understand the areas of focus, the approach to giving, and uh, you know, everything that lies within. And I think zooming out of that, um, some ideas uh, more at either an ecosystem level or from a funder's lens as to what fundraisers need to learn and keep in mind as they look to amplify their efforts uh, in raising funds. So uh, just uh, for our audience to know, uh, we're going to spend the first roughly 30 to 40 minutes uh, while I have a conversation with Motushi around some of these key themes. And uh, then we'll take audience questions. What you can do is type your questions into the Q&A box or the chat box. Uh, the team will be curating the questions so that we can take them up when we open. So that's about it. Uh, Motishi, thanks again for joining us. I know that um, you, know, you had plans and you've accommodated this session despite that. So really grateful for you making the time. Um, and I think uh, just to kickstart this conversation, I'd love to hear from you about uh, the MacArthur Foundation, a little bit about its history. I know that 
uh, I mean, as more than 42 years old uh, in the field, uh, it's had its own evolution. So would love to hear a little bit about uh, its overall history and the work in India. Sure. Thank you for thinking of me for this session. This is, um, this is an area of keen interest for me as well um, in terms of figuring out uh, the fundraising techniques and uh, strategies um, as such. And so I look forward to a very interesting discussion forward as such. Um, so just to talk about uh, MacArthur Foundation, we are one of the larger US-based foundations with our headquarters in Chicago. Started operating sometime in 19, in the early 80s, um, and uh, in fact, started out with programs on environment um, uh, protection to start out. And then over the um, decades that followed, I mean, we moved on to areas like population and reproductive health, some girls' secondary education, looking at uh, issues around uh, you know, human rights and international justice. I'm talking about the global uh, program as such. In India, the uh, India office of the foundation was set up in 1995, and uh, mainly with the idea of um, having a field level presence to work with the health program, the population and reproductive health program of the foundation. So we started out by supporting a set of fellowships, mid-career fellowships um, here. A little like what MacArthur supports in the US, the MacArthur Fellows are fairly well known in the field. And we thought we would try something like that in India for our health program. That particular program ran from 1995 to 2007 in different forms, but there was a fellowship program till then. Um, but from 2000, 1999 onwards, in fact, we also started making grants to institutions. And some of those institutions were um, set up by our fellows and some of them in fact came to MacArthur for uh, with really, really exciting ideas. And um, in the last um, so many years really, in fact, I was doing some maths a little while back, we ended up supporting 539 different grants. Um, institute, we have made 539 institutional grants from 1986, when the first grant was made to India to um, 2021, the first quarter of 2021, there were 539 grants with a total outlay of 205 million US dollars. Um, the size of the grants have been very, um, you know, very diverse. I mean, we are, I think smallest grant was to, um, was about 100,000. And we have also made grants which are multi-million uh, but typically, it ranges from uh, 500,000, 300,000 to 700,000. That's that's the average grant size. And um, initially, the program was on population and reproductive health. But since 2015, the uh, MacArthur's grant making in India has been almost solely directed towards climate change mitigation. So as we speak, uh, our focus um, is uh, programmatic focus has been totally on climate change mitigation. But um, given the incidence of COVID and in the last, um, you know, seeing what is happening here, we were also, um, you know, opportunistic and we were able to make um, a significant number of grants towards COVID relief um, and uh, rehabilitation as well, um, which is probably not even a drop in the ocean in terms of what is required. But we, we think that it was an important, it is a really, really important cause. And the fact that we were able to make that contribution makes us feel good. Thanks. No, absolutely, Madhushi. And I think uh, it's been that flexibility from funders like uh, the MacArthur Foundation that's actually kept afloat the brilliant work by so many civil society organizations through this time. Um, so uh, really appreciate that. I think I just want to uh, pick from there, you know, like, of course, the areas of giving uh, and priority have evolved over time. Uh, but I'm sure uh, what's also been a factor through this time, uh, which is perhaps which cuts across domains, is how you select the partners that you work with. So could you share with us a little bit about what you look for in an organization uh, partner? when you're trying to assess whether they'll make for a good fit? Sure. Um, I don't think there is any clear black and white set of guidelines to say that this, or a, you know, a binary consideration to say, 
this works and this does not work, except for some very, very basic uh, criteria. And what are those basic criteria? Um, I'll tell you. Um, if an organization approaches us um, to do work which is not in alignment, no, I mean, we can't see any points of intersection between what the organization is proposing to take up and the strategic priorities of MacArthur Foundation. Um, it is very difficult to um, you know, figure out a way to support that organization, no matter how impressed I am personally with the leadership and the type of idea that they bring forth. So the first point of alignment that we look for is that, you know, does the work align with the project, uh, the, the programmatic priorities of the foundation? So in our case, it is climate change uh, mitigation, right? So um, again, this is not in any way trying to minimize the importance of other thematic areas. Um, but I think like MacArthur, every, uh, I wouldn't say each and every foundation, there are some foundation who have the, you know, who have, uh, made very, very flexible grants and continue to do so. But largely, I would say 70 to 80 percent of the foundations um, have figure, you know, have got a certain set of priorities that they have identified for themselves, uh, which has been done in consultation with their governing boards and their internal stakeholders. Um, so my suggestion would be that, you know, in case you are planning to really approach an organization, the first poll, you know, first thing to check out is to see if there are areas of common interest. Um, but that said, uh, Nikita, I mean, I will share this um, quite candidly that practically 50 to 60% of my time when I'm in office, I mean, things have been very different in the last one and a half years, but 50 to 60% of my time actually is dedicated towards, um, you know, meeting new um, new organizations and you know people who want to present their ideas because just like uh, an organization is seeking out funds we are also on the lookout for organizations who we think can create impact on the ground so it is a mutual interest to find the, those organizations as such. so um i i think it's in common interest so i spend a lot of time my colleagues spend a lot of time we get sometimes a lot of um, uh, get emails uh, introducing a particular uh, idea. Sometimes they look exciting on the first email itself. Sometimes, you know, you have to really dig in deeper, but seeking out ideas is all, or, and project ideas that we can support, um, recognizing the fact that philanthropic capital is actually quite limited, very, very limited, and it's probably the rarest form of capital possible. You are on the lookout for exciting, innovative ideas that you think can, you know, take the discussion to the next level. Absolutely. So uh, definitely look for alignment with the funders' uh, priority areas. And remember that the funders are also looking for you are the two things that I'm taking away from that. Just to build on that, Motoshi, I think one advice that we often hear is um, sometimes your work uh, in its most uh, natural description, instinctive description, may not be a direct fit. Uh, but there could be ways for you to either reframe or highlight aspects of your work that can, uh, you know, lead to that alignment. Um, do you see that happen a lot? Uh, can you, or do, do any examples come to mind of organizations where uh, the alignment to begin with was perhaps relatively faint, uh, but digging in, you know, just exploring together helped you come to a common ground with it? Yeah. That also happens. Um, see what hap What I mean, meeting people, going through emails is one way of um, you know identifying the right um, fit with organizations. And I think, frankly speaking, it's a two-way process. I mean, even if you as as a fund seeker, you should also be looking for an organization which is going to be supportive of your work and not really dig in very deep to challenge you at every level as such, because that would actually constrain you on the ground, right? So it is a two-way street. And as a funder, I should also be looking for an organization which I think is uh, well equipped to deliver the project concept as such. What are the other ways by which we uh, look for uh, new organizations? I mean, it could be through people we have worked with in the past, and I know probably I can't support them now, but if there is a change in program priorities, for instance, if when I move from, let's say, 
health to education if i have worked with a organization maybe um you know in my past let's say 20 years back or 15 years back and they were doing a good job you go and start exploring to see where has that organization reached and is there still a chance then there are networks you know um, peer to peer networks so if i am keen to support a work in let's say in the field of um, you know gender justice for instance i will actually be in touch with my colleagues in ford foundation in some of the other uh, foundations to check you know if they have a repository of institutions that they can offer for a first review right so there are different ways of looking at it um, but i should also highlight that most of these foundations um, you know are very very thinly staffed and so we don't really have the capacity to put out open invitations in most of, i mean open invitations most of the times to say you know this is the program that we are seeking inputs from um, uh, so please come in if there is a ideally that should be the case right if if i am supporting climate change then i should actually put it out in the open arena to say that you know please come and um, apply right we don't have the administrative bandwidth to deal with that level of detail as such but over a period of time you keep on building and revisiting your base to see whether you have got a good right set of um, organizations that you're dealing with and when i say you i'm talking about makatha and i think most foundations employ uh, similar strategies to figure out a set of um, organizations um, and sometimes it's through collaboratives that are already there on the ground that you get to see very good work happening um, and you know you want to support uh, that organization as well so um, yeah but getting a good um, organization to support is also something which is super exciting for us absolutely um so i just uh, wanted to also uh, you know dig deeper into the foundational step of course is to ensure that there's alignment uh, in the foundation's mission and the work that the organization is doing are there any at macarthur specifically are there any other key markers that you tend to uh, keep in mind uh, let's say the stage of the organization or uh, you know some some foundations of course tend to have a specific focus on the founders own potential any such uh you know nuances that you can share with us about your approach sure. yes there are other things so suppose i uh, am meeting somebody um who has who is working in the field of climate change mitigation i would actually look uh, to see how uh, clearly they have set out their theory of change now theory of change there are various iterations to theory of change but even just in simple terms to say that you know if this is the output that i am trying to achieve what do i need to do what is the process what are the processes that i need to deploy to be able to achieve that so if i if the person that i am meeting is able to articulate that in in a way that gives me the confidence to say yes um, the model is set up then we, we take it to the next stage of discussion right to say that okay fine this is this is what you are trying to achieve and given your current stage where you are today how do you think you are going to reach that and so i'll go back to a question that you raised before this to say that you know through digging deeper can you actually um have you ever come across situations where there is better alignment than before yes this is the stage where you know okay broadly you say there is alignment on um, you know on the programmatic priority but then you also look for you know whether the the organization has clear understanding of what it is trying to achieve what are the steps it is going it is going to take to be able to um, achieve what it what it wants support for i would also look for things like you know what is the capability of this organization to deliver so if somebody says i can deliver the moon does it look does it sound realistic probably not um does it help us you know in terms of reaching there no so let's let's then get real and say okay fine what it is that you can achieve so um you look at um the theory of change the processes the capabilities of that organization not just at the leadership level but also where the work will actually take place so it is ideally speaking it it shouldn't be just the 
the top leader who brings in that set of skills you would expect an organization um, you know which has skills built in at different levels um, to you know to be to seek support as that um, the third thing that you would look for is that is this an organization which is um, if not you know i wouldn't say reputed but does it have policies around you know workplace considerations does it honor um, diversity does it look at um, you know uh, things like uh, workplace issues does it have uh, systems and processes in place that's very important to take care of um, and then i think one very important uh, consideration nikita is to see if what this organization is proposing to do is something that should be actually be done by some other agency for instance there are times you we are placed with ideas project ideas for support which is um, which is looking at you know doing work which is which should ideally be done by government now there is a standard i mean we understand that you know things though they are in the area of uh, government support are not working on the ground sometimes and so a civil society organization needs to work there that's that's understandable but if the fundamental model is to continue to do work which the government should be doing or a corporate should be doing then you start questioning i mean if if let's say the organization comes and says 10 years down the line this model will continue to be done by us only you know it it may be important that this gets done but is that something that is that a model that philanthropy can continue to support forever so those are the questions that we try putting to ourselves when when an idea is presented to say or is an alternative to that going to be to say that i will do it for the for two years in the meantime i will set up a network i will set up a group of people who can take on this element to carry forward ourselves so some level of sustainability for the project idea uh, to you know which gives the funder some assurance to say that okay beyond the our period of engagement this project is not going to die a natural death there is there is something that the organization can continue to do uh, beyond that now i also would like to qualify that you know the conditions of uh, the, supporting humanitarian aid are quite different from this so i'm not trying to cover this under that but under normal times these are things that i think would that would come uh, very clearly under focus watashi thank you so much so if i uh, you know were to just summarize your four points uh, you talked about the theory of change just having a rock solid theory of change and uh, the second point uh, in relation to that was uh you know how realistic is what you're saying you'll achieve uh but it's really the last two that i thought uh, were really different from what we often hear right the uh, third point that you made about making sure that the culture and values of your organization is something that your uh, you know funding partner would be able to appreciate and work with and lastly uh you know almost having a plan to make your own work redundant because that's Absolutely. the actual change that uh, one is hoping for and sometimes we can be so lost in our ambitions for our work that we don't really stop to answer that question or at least that's not front and center for most organizations so i'd yeah. really like to highlight these two things for our uh, attendees uh, today uh, lovely thank you so much um just going ahead to the actual process motishi um i know you said that uh, typically because uh, the foundations are thinly staffed uh, you know just the process uh, often times can uh, rely on existing uh, networks referrals some degree of reaching out responding to organizations that are emailing you for support um but from the time of contact to uh, you know things actually materializing into a formal partnership how you seen that process to typically flow and what all goes into it from both ends uh, from the organization and the foundation thanks nikita i think it's different for different foundations um, in this particular space um, i know foundations here in india who actually do their own grant making for us uh, particularly we have a team which is you know 
which is based in chicago of which we are largely based in chicago but we are also part of those teams so when we get a interesting idea or a set of interesting ideas every quarter beginning of every quarter we you know we discuss those together and then once that moves in there are other levels to which you have to move the idea to uh, i'm talking about just makatha um, so that, that that happens on a quarterly basis but i am also aware of other foundations who have who sort of take the idea they will they have their own individual processes but typically most organizations unless i'm talking about some very very big uh, foundations here and one or two which are very famous and i think men most participants are aware of them as well who do a lot of grant making from itself most foundations actually have processes which involve their india office and their head of head offices as such so it is basically starting a i wouldn't say an obstacle race but it's like you know you have to just clear different levels of scrutiny and um, different sets of questions uh, making sure that you're looking at legal issues um, that you want to be within the within the framework that is set by the local laws um, as well as the laws set up by the head office you all want to make sure that you know um, the grant management practices of the receiving foundations are in alignment with what you are doing the financial management practices are in line with you know the basic minimum standards that have been set up for you these are over and above the programmatic considerations that come through so once even once the programmatic idea has received its support and go ahead there are these all these other layers you know that you have to cut through to make sure that um, you know you get the grants actually reaching the organization as such but for i mean for us it doesn't take that much time once the idea is sort of taken up and you know again there are no promises 100% promises to say that you know yes it the money will flow in but typically from the point when the idea is presented to the idea i mean if there are budgets available i mean that's a big consideration because every foundation has an annual budget um, typically allocated for a particular program right but if there are budgets available and the idea seems exciting i mean this whole thing can get done within maximum 4 to 6 months i would say i mean and so in some cases it's 3 months as well so it is not very long drawn necessarily but um, i think there are considerations of you know whether the budget is available uh, when does the next uh, meeting you know next round of considerations taking place and all that yeah thank you that's uh, actually quite encouraging to know because i think uh, for many people the concern is it feels like an endless cycle of discussing rediscussing resubmitting proposals so thank you for sharing that with us but i'd also like uh, to request people to be patient with us as well <laughs> just because we are also dealing with institutions at the back end you see and uh, even with when you are trying to be completely supportive sometimes we end up making demands on your time and i know uh, you know your time is also very stretched so totally acknowledging that but please bear with us as we go through this question it is to try to make things easier for later yeah yeah absolutely absolutely um but just uh, coming back to the piece on how people discover opportunities with foundations right so just uh, in the context of makatha what would you suggest to people who are uh, you know looking to initiate the conversation um is it just sending an email to the foundation or do you think there are actually ways to smartly reach out cultivate a relationship over some time what's your suggestion to fundraisers on that i think the first and uh, first step is to do web searches you know to go go to the website figure out what the points of uh, you know what are the areas of programmatic priorities um that is as i said that is literally the gatekeeper if there is no alignment it is really really very difficult i much as i would like to i cannot support artists um you know from rural areas even if i wanted to right so website searches are very important um in our case particularly we put up examples of uh, grants that have been supported in the past as well so it also will give fundraisers some idea to say that okay fine you know these are the type of ideas that 
usually have been supported by MacArthur. So you will get um, allocations as well as the, the principal purpose of that particular grant as such, if you go down um, under the India page um, as such. Most foundations have some form of information which are available in, the, in their websites. So that is the first port of call. Second, I would say is that, you know, to develop a project idea, um, you know, in line, once you have identified a gap area, and I would suggest that, you know, develop the project idea to a point where you think you've got enough meat to put, put it together in some form of a concept note. And then, then seek out an appointment or you know, seek out an interaction where you can discuss this. And that idea may go through some different levels of ramifications. And sometimes I'll tell you, there are, I mean, you come across situations where there may be a similar idea has been supported in the past. So when I'm looking at um, supporting, let's say five grants um, or whatever number I'm talking about, if I receive an idea, which seems it is a very interesting one, but if I know that, let's say in the last quarter, I have some, such a, you know, supported something very similar, then in fact, I may actually come back and hold a, a, you know, a more exploratory conversation with this organization to say, what other areas of interest are you working on? So if it is the same idea coming from different, so it is an iterative process. And that's why I would say that, you know, there, is, there are no binaries to say yes and no. It has to be seen in the context of the project idea that is being proposed. But I think broadly you can say that, you know, this, this will fly and this will not um, as you move forward. Yeah. Yeah. So really smart research is the key there. Uh, yeah. Figuring that. Thank you. Um, also, Mothashi, when you uh, look at the organization's budget, um, to what extent, uh, you know, do you uh, have guidelines or, uh, you know, influence over, you know, programmatic funding versus funding for other cost heads, uh, either capacity building or other areas? Just what's your perspective uh, on it personally and, you know, as a foundation, how do you deal with that? No, very good question. So. Um... The way we look at it is, you know, a few things really. I mean, I mean, we have recently changed our policy regarding indirect costs. So if somebody is comes back to request for 100 rupees, for instance, then the way we would go about looking at it is that, you know, we would expect roughly about, um, you know, 75% or so, or 75 to 80% to be spent on the program. And 29% of that 75% should, which ideally together should come to add up to 100% to be spent on um, indirect costs. So the difference is that, you know, on a programmatic, uh, when you put on a programmatic um, budget line, we expect that line to contribute directly to the project objective that you have set yourself up for. The indirect cost component is expected to meet costs that cannot be directly allocated to uh, the program itself. So costs which can't be directly allocated, but are important for the organization to carry, um, to be to address, those can be covered under the indirect cost um, component, of, um, comp component of that particular project. Now, we have had requests in some cases, especially for larger organizations. So come back and say, can, said that you know we we probably don't need twenty nine percent. We need a lesser sum because some of the indirect costs are also covered by other funders. Um, and we've also received uh, requests to say, can we have fifty percent in indirect costs? Right. For us, the in, uh, the twenty nine percent is sort of sacrosanct. In most cases, there are some grants where we we don't ask how the money is spent, which is which are basically we say these are operate, general operating grants, uh, which are really very rare for India. I mean, I, literally, it's less than five actually, even now. Uh, but under certain conditions, we do provide support to an organization where they have the flexibility to use the money the way they want, provided they achieve a certain set of objectives. But typically, our grant making is tied to project ideas, um, specifically where we have conversations with the grantee institution to say that, okay, fine, if this is the money which is allocated, 
this is how it's going to be spent to achieve this set of objectives. All right, thank you so much, Marushi. Um, just I think uh, one last piece about uh, the foundation's approach. Do you think the stage or size of the organization uh, is, uh, you know, influences decision making? And I specifically ask this because, you know, especially for the younger organizations, uh, even if they are able to get uh, through the SCRA hurdle, sometimes the historical record, uh, you know, just the impact metrics might still be evolving and, uh, you know, they, they might be forming some of their narrative around the impact they've already created and hope to create further on. So um, one, uh, in your portfolio, do you see a skew towards a certain scale and size uh, or phase? And uh, what would be your advice to some of the younger organizations who are still finding their feet in that process? Yeah. So, you know, again, I think there are different um, organize, different funders who look for supporting different sets of ideas as such. The way I would like to um, describe our approach, MacArthur's approach is that we usually go for ideas with, where there is a, um, there is some proof of concept. Uh, so we don't come in at the stage where the idea is completely experimental. Um, unless the found, unless the organization has a very strong record of doing similar work and is trying to do something very new, that that is understandable and which is in alignment with the project objectives. But if it's a new organization, if it's a really really young organization um, and it's trying to uh, seek funding, it seeks funding for an idea which is really really very early stage then it is, I wouldn't say not possible, uh, but I would just say that, you know, probably lesser chances of that being considered by MacArthur as opposed to one or two other foundations which look for alpha level uh, support. So for instance, the said foundation, uh, which is there, um, which is in the Netherlands and uh, their support sizes are anywhere between 20,000 to 50,000 US dollars. And sometimes, up to 100,000. For us, our support sizes are usually always over 100,000. So for that sort of, you know, packages, you would like to have proof of concept. I mean, these are things that, you know, I can, I'm speaking from experience, you know, in terms of dealing with um, the different types of ideas um, that, uh, you know, we can continue to receive as such. So we come in at that stage, you know, where there is some proof of concept. Completely. Thank you. And that actually allows me a good segue into, uh, you know, the second theme that I uh, wanted to cover with you, which is mostly just, uh, you know, understanding uh, your getting your inputs and advice for fundraisers overall, right, in their process. So uh, I'll start with something very basic. Uh, given that you interact with so many fundraisers, uh, all with their different approaches, are there any absolute yes, please do this if you want funding and complete no, you cannot afford to make these mistakes. You're really putting me in a spot now. <laughs> uh, interestingly, Nikita, you know, the most of my conversations are usually start with a programmatic person, a program person, um, and then followed up by the fundraiser as such. Um, I, I do have conversations with the fundraisers also, but when the ideas, I mean, if it's a first conversation, it's usually a fundraiser who also understands and links in with the program very closely. So if you're asking me for do's, then I would definitely ask all my fundraiser friends here to really dig deep into the program that they are trying to seek the funds for to understand uh, you know, what is it that the program is trying to achieve. There are lots of times you figure, you understand that you know, the program person and the fundraiser are talking different things um, when it comes down to really developing that project idea further, right? That is a complete red herring to a funder that they don't, that within, that within the institution, there is no alignment. 
so if you are going to go and make a pitch to a funder please get your story in line with one another making sure that you're talking the same story right um i would also like to say that you know i think we all like good stories and when i say good stories they don't necessarily need to have happy endings but we like stories where you know it is clear that okay fine these are the main actors thinking through the contours of what you are trying to achieve that needs clarity um and you know if you are able to explain that to a fundraise uh, to a funding agency in easy terms that these are issues um, that you know need attention and this is what we are trying to do so some understanding of the context um the, the larger context who is doing what uh, who are the key actors making sure that your there is a clear fit for your own um for the project that you are seeking funding for that is very important to understand so um and also trying to get to know as much about the funding agency in advance of your call to that agency as possible because that's something that you would expect i mean very clearly to say that okay has the person done the research that is as i said i mean that's very important and if you are really making statements or you know talking about things which are not in alignment it is a waste of time on both ends i would say um so um basically i think it's important to get your story in alignment making sure that you have done your um, web search um, in advance um and i know i mean in some bigger organizations fundraisers spend enormous amount of time to scope out the universe of fund funders and macarthur is just one organization there there would be many others to figure out what are the strengths and i'm sure there are weaknesses that we each funding agency bring to the table as such um so acknowledging that and building your strategy around it that's very important i can't say that my fundraising uh, my programmatic grant making strategy is perfect it is not i'm sure there are things that others do better but as a fundraiser to be aware um, of in individual funders and their um, typical patterns of support uh, that they make available that's very important as much research as you can do talking to other grantee institutions who can guide you into this um, having conversations figuring out i think preparing in advance makes a lot of difference yeah yeah absolutely and i think um, you know this point on research emerges over and over because i feel like um, sometimes uh, the pattern we see is there's a basic level of research that uh, people are able to do but the granular clarity on what the foundation any funder is actually looking for um if one spends enough time uh, on the web search uh, there are enough cues hidden somewhere yeah. in the language to actually you decode a lot of it and uh, uh, sometimes we tend to miss that also thank you for highlighting uh, you know just the fact that fundraisers uh, you know while in many organizations the ceo themselves might be spending a lot of time uh, doing key fundraising activities uh fact is that um, sometimes fundraising teams can work in silos and hence just have uh you know either a very broad context of what the organization is doing uh, the story the sexy story that the organization wants to tell and the moment it goes into the detailed discussion with the funder that's where the you know cracks in the narrative start to emerge so definitely worth every fundraiser's time to uh actually carve out time to spend with program yeah. teams so that they have one round understanding of uh, what's happening yeah thank you for highlighting this um great uh, i think uh, also uh, organizationally uh, you know if from your portfolio organizations or other observations um as organizations look to build their development verticals right like uh, while they grow they are looking to build their teams um do you have any suggestions on what that strategy should look like uh, either in terms of the skill sets or the profiles they should look to bring in um and this could be from your own observations right of organizations who've been successful and what you've noticed to be working in their strategy yeah um thanks so it is sometimes i feel that uh, you know probably uh, 
we are being very demanding of the sector sometimes because i know the the sector itself is very super stretched um as such but i would definitely say that you know if you are able to invest time to figure out i wouldn't even go to the extent of compulsorily defining vision mission or whatever but um if you could say that where do you see yourself in 5 years time you know if it is and what are the problems you are, will you be tackling then if if you could ask questions like that what are the problems that i will be tackling where would i see myself as in comparison to some of my key um you know comparative um agencies comparative agencies um where um which are the key stakeholders i will be working with and what would my role be i mean would i continue to be a service delivery organization would i li like to see myself to be a advocacy organization in 5 years time would i like to see myself as a you know a research organization or if could i would i be you know do i want to develop as a community based organization that i continue to support the community across a whole host of public delivery goods um so that's very important i think what i see um i wouldn't say lacking because i know the sector is super stretched but uh, what i see sometimes missing in um, i wouldn't say sometimes a lot of times missing is to say in 5 years time or whatever time horizon you have in mind this is where um you know i would like to see my role emerging no matter where i am today and then working out a pathway there once you do that you know and you have brought in your board or governing um, institution into that had their support um then you you know it actually starts opening out for you the type of uh, people that you need in the organization to deliver that larger picture where you see yourself you start developing skills where you don't get the right people there you would start bringing in you know members in the governing board also who can guide you to reach there so it's very important for every organization i feel to invest time whatever little time you are able to squeeze out to say that in 5 years time where again 5 years is something that i'm just taking as a as a number you may decide on a 10 years time or you may decide on a 3 years time that's up to you to decide the time frame but figuring out your pathway after you have sort of made that larger super statement to say in 3 years time i want to be the key advocacy organization on the issue of dealing with let's say harassment at workplace in the state of chatisgarh i'm just taking an example right is very important because that itself starts giving power to the various parts of that statement that okay fine i should have some a presence in chatisgarh i should be looking at workplace issues what type of workplace issues are, am i talking about what are the advocacy areas that i am looking at how do i go about plugging those gaps you know and not everything needs to be done by me as an organization i can actually enlist the help of some of my peer organizations who may be better at it right and but this is the role that i see for myself so i think there is a lot of power once you have developed that statement for yourself thank you that's not sure uh, if that made sense <laughs> yeah. uh, it absolutely did thank you so much i also see that uh, we have a lot of questions coming in from the audience so i'll uh, take some of those uh, now um just uh, question may i please pratish go ahead uh, motishi i wanted to uh, uh, go back to your earlier statement wherein you said that you know the organization took a strategic shift to support climate change population and reproductive health uh, and technology for public interest and i wanted to uh, ask you in terms of uh, how does the organize how does the foundation take these decisions these are huge decisions and of course and also looking forward covid has been such a watershed moment in our history uh, how, does does the organization plan to shift its uh, causes when it comes to or re revisit the causes which which it wants to support in the coming future this is no problem so um, you're absolutely right these are very big shifts 
uh, tectonic shifts almost uh, when an organization decides to move from one particular area to another. What all does it involve? It, and the triggers can be many really. It could be COVID, it could be about, um, you know, a major pressure from the governing board itself to say that, you know, which is what happened in our case when we actually, in 2014, 15, when our governing board, uh, the global governing board actually pushed management to say, come and tell us the incremental value of staying engaged in whatever you're doing today. So which really pushed very, very hard internal thinking to say, does it really, really make sense to do what I was doing 15 years back? Um, I know, and in some cases it was 10 years, some cases, and because there were different themes which had come up in different points in time, but they really pushed her back to say that we want you to do a fundamental review of each of these themes and come back and tell us what is the incremental value of MacArthur staying engaged there. So that was a big watershed moment for us. COVID has also been a watershed moment for not only us in India, but across um, the globe as such, including the US as such. How it has impacted our programs uh, in the short term is that you know, we have very consciously decided that we will try to bring in a much stronger focus on equity issues in our thematic areas. So if you see MacArthur's grant making from 2015 to 20, early 2020, um, a lot of grant making was done on areas of research, on evaluation, in terms of um, you know, trying to figure out alternative scenarios by which India can achieve its climate goals. India can um, you know, accelerate the process of adopting renewable energy. Uh, what we said in uh, September 2020 was that you know, going forward, we will try to make sure that all our grant making uh, has a much stronger focus on equity. Uh, what do we mean by equity? Basically saying that, you know, we will make grants to, uh, you know, community-based organizations and research institutions where they are going to pay special attention to see that communities who are going to be affected by this change can adjust to this change properly and we can support them in special ways um, so that, you know, they are not disproportionately affected. So, and how did that come through? Because we saw, we saw the type of rampage that COVID actually drove last year. So looking at millions walking back to their homes, trying to figure out ways of sustenance, people losing their jobs. I think it has brought a much stronger focus back to the communities which need the support. And I'm not talking just for Makatha. I, I see that with many of my peer foundations. They are also trying to, you know, rework their strategies to make sure that there are there is stronger focus on supporting civil society organizations, who in turn are supporting communities. Thank you. Thanks, Madhushi. I think I'll just uh, go to some of the questions that people are asking, and uh, I think that. Uh, Not able to hear Nikita. Nikita goes. I'm sorry. Am I audible uh, now? Yes. Okay. Um, just a heads up, uh, Zoom is giving me a notification that my network is unstable. So in case I disappear, Pratyush, just uh, take the question. Sure. Uh, anyway, what I was saying that uh, I think uh, quite a few people here are curious about, you know, just the, F the aftermath of uh, the FCRA amendments. And uh, it'll be interesting to actually hear from you as to what, you know, I think when we last met, uh, the amendments had just come into place. It was more recent, but... Uh, uh, what have you seen to be the actual practical challenges emerging for uh, NGOs as a result of the amendments? Uh, of course, I know that many people are still struggling with uh, getting the SBI account, uh, although there's an extension now, so there's some respite on that count. Uh, but, you know, uh, the subgrants not being allowed, the fact that there's, uh, you know, a cap on uh, costs to 20% uh, from the earlier 50%, all of those things. How have you seen it uh, you know, impact some of you know, maybe your partners and network organizations? 
And do you have any, again, advice for NGOs how to navigate uh, these complications? You should ask the lawyers. But <laughs> um, no, I think last year, the FCRA amendments were a major watershed point as such. And our interpretation um, of the changes that were proposed and, you know, uh, that, that came through after that was basically to say that, you know, the, the, there is a clear call for more clarity in terms of the work that is that is to be supported through FCRA funds, uh, foreign funds as such. And so we have been discussing with our grantees much more clearly in terms of saying that, give us better understanding of the activities that you are going to take place and being in alignment with that, um, with what the FCRA regulations require, things that, um, I mean, being even more cognizant, we were always, um, aligned to what the regulatory requirements have been. We continue to be, but seeking that confirmation from our guarantees as well. So one of the things that MacArthur instituted since September was to get a sign off from every grantee to say that they are in alignment with FCRA on an annual basis. Um, it is it is put in much more in the in the domain of the grantees themselves because they now have to do much more reporting um, in terms of uh, going forward. There are limitations in terms of not being able to subgrant, which has affected a few of our grantees, but fairly small number. I mean, then they're still trying to uh, work out their models of delivery post FCRA amendments, um, and we are supportive of their actions. Uh, but largely for most of our, of our grantees, I mean, I think I would say 95%, they are all, we make grants to institutions who implement the projects themselves. So they have not particularly been affected. They have not been, you know, directly. I mean, I think the FCRA amendments have had influence on all organizations, but um, I think we are, at a, we are in a space where they have been able to continue their work um, as such. And of course, there are issues around SBI accounts, but I think those are logistical issues that every organization is actually uh, trying to navigate around. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, this is helpful. There's another question which is specific to uh, your area of priority. Um, this is from Shalini, and uh, she says, unlike some of the uh, developed nations, India is still catching up on. Uh, you know, interventions in climate change uh, mitigation uh, with a lot of work yet to be done at regulatory and uh, policy levels um, for Indian organizations to be able to scale up their operations or venture full time into the space. Um, do you have some thoughts on how MacArthur is, uh, you know, looking to enable more enterprises uh, to start working into the space? Sorry, uh, when we talk about enterprises, is this uh, for development enterprises or impact investment enterprises, um, if you could clarify? I'm sorry, Motishi, I seem to have gotten disconnected. Uh, I think uh, when I'm, we're seeing enterprises, uh, any social purpose enterprises, it could be largely non-profits is my assumption, but perhaps for profit. I, I would assume in this context, it's non-profit enterprises. It's not mentioned okay. in the No, um, Shalini, I mean, I think uh, you're absolutely right. We totally acknowledge that, you know, um, there's a lot which is yet to take place in India. And uh, India has strong economic aspirations as well, which is absolutely essential for to achieve its development goals. So um, we completely are in acknowledgement of that. We also recognize is that you know if the graph that captures the you know absolute amounts of greenhouse gas emissions that are um, that are generated by the country that is also rising fairly rapidly um, not last year because of covid the, and the lockdowns that took place but largely i think we are we are among the first three in terms of the amounts um, of greenhouse gas emissions that take place as such so the way we try approaching grant making here is to say that you know are there pathways by which um, India can continue to achieve its economic aspirations but 
with lesser levels of GHG emissions? I mean, are there low carbon growth pathways possible? And much of our grant making is actually directed at finding out those low carbon growth paths. Thankfully, you know, those alternatives exist. So you do have alternatives where solar energy can play a much um, stronger role. Um, you have other forms of renewable energies uh, playing a much bigger role as such. So um, it is completely you know, possible to do that. It requires investment, both in terms of money as well as technology, which government of India has been very, has very clearly articulated and they are on strong ground on that. And many of our grantees are working very closely with the ministries, um, both at the central and at the state level, trying to figure out those growth pathways and trying to work out you know, how they can move forward on this. I don't know if I've answered your question. I've assumed that it is for not for not for profit sector. If you are talking about a for profit sector, it, you know, then of course the answers are different. And I think the market for for profit is also opening up fairly quickly in the renewable energy space. And I think there is a lot of scope uh, there uh, as such. Thanks, Patashi. Um, I also see a few questions that are trying to actually get a sense of what really comes under direct costs, indirect costs. So I'll uh, you know, just read out a couple of those questions uh, so that we can take them together. Uh, so one is around how often updates are asked of the uh, grantees, right? And uh, in terms of just outlining the actual utilization of funds and the breakup between uh, all the cost heads uh, that were uh, included in the initial uh, proposal. And uh, one of our cohort members who's, uh, who leads uh, the organization called Waste Warriors, I don't know uh, if you're familiar with them, um, is uh, also keen to ask, uh, we invest in building capacities of the local and district administration to take up ownership of the project once we've established the collection and recycling system. Will the HR costs involved in government capacity building be included in programmatic costs or indirect? It would be programmatic costs for us because, you know, um, staff costs which are directly attributable to delivery of the program come under direct costs. But staff costs which cannot be at directly attributed, for instance, the cost of uh, running a research library in the organization, for instance or um, you know, a general leadership course for all the managers or you know, senior executives, or let's say um, just costs of buildings um, that you know, which cannot be attributed as such is how, um, I mean, would come under indirect costs, which cannot be attributed to any one single program uh, or project. So those would be under indirect costs. Thanks, Motishi. Um, again, I think a bunch of questions, uh, just trying to understand, uh, you know, how the relationship pans out over a period of time between uh, the funding uh, organizations and their uh, grantees. So um, it seems that many people here uh, have either witnessed or uh, feel like, you know, funders often don't commit to uh, a longer term partnership or uh, you know, partnerships just fail early on in the process. Uh, and that's always a possibility. But do you have some insights into what could be some difficult situations or, you know, uh, bad practices essentially that could make a relationship go sour? And, uh, you know, for uh, even for funders who prefer uh, multi year grants and longer term partnerships to actually pull out of a relationship? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, for us in Makatha, we typically um, enter into grant agreements which are which run anywhere between two to three years. Um, it could be 18 months as well, but definitely over one year, you know, so there is funding which is there. And then it would depend on um, at the end of that period, whether you see what is, uh, you know, whether to continue funding for that project idea as such. And again, I'm talking about Makatha as such. We, when you are seeking a renewal of a grant at the end of third year, we would not be 
looking at continuing with the same set of activities. So just as um, you expect, um, you know, the, the development challenge to be responded to um, in a particular way, the challenge itself evolves over time, right? So at the end of three years, if the grantee comes back to say that, you know, we started at point A, we have reached at point B, but the next stage of support requires um, us to work, you know, in three, these three different ways, then it's a good conversation. But if the grantee comes and says that you continue to support the same activities that you have done for the first three years, most funders would actually sit back and think. And in some cases, Nikita, there is a good case to do that. But in most cases, um, you know, funders would look for the next stage of activities that are essential for achieving the larger goal. That's very important. In the meantime, when do you pull out? I think if there are reputational issues with the organization, that's very important. I mean, if there are cases, as I said, workplace issues, uh, values, culture, you know, those, there are major incidences which come to light, then it is very difficult, um, you know, continuing. Of course, there is a process and then sometimes, you know, you come back to say, okay, fine, this was raised, but, you know, it has been effectively resolved and can be, and the, the organization has put in systems and processes that it doesn't occur again. Um, that That's an individual conversation. and. Um, you know, which needs to be happen. That's one. Second is if there are fiduciary challenges, if there has been uh, questions around the way the money has been utilized, if there are proper systems and processes in place as such, and money has been misutilized um, in a big way without letting the, I mean, sometimes it can be easy ones where there has been, where the money has been used in a different way than what was initially proposed. And the funder has not been approved, has not been, um, informed of this change as such. So if there are cases like that, then probably after a discussion, you figure out whether this is admissible or not admissible. But if there are issues around where mismanagement of finances, then there are questions. Audit reports is another, um, another uh, point where a funder would really look for. The funder would also look for cases, I mean, another reason why funders often have to move away is the fact that, you know, their own priorities have changed. Um, if, the, if, if the priorities have changed, and sometimes you have to let go of very good partners because the institutional priorities have changed completely. So you try providing legacy help, even for our population and a productive health program and our secondary education program, we had anywhere between two to three years of support available to our grantees, even after taking the decision that we would be moving out of that field mm -hmm. as such. So there was a legacy period um, and where we were doing very different types of things um, in terms of you know trying to help these set of grantees who we greatly value to say that, you know if not us, can we actually help them or equip them to seek funding from other sources? Mm -hmm. Um, so establishing their business model, establishing their ways of working as such. So there was a lot of funding which was made available during that period for these. And so there are various reasons why that, you know, a particular relationship may actually come to a close. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, unless it's something that really puts the, organ, the funding, funder organization um, in a major risk of reputation or fiduciary risk as such, there are many times you go back to an older grantee on a particular case. So for instance, for our COVID work, we have gone back to some of our community-based organizations who we had worked with um, you know, before 2015, because we know that their work with the communities is really very strong and that reputation has stayed with us. So we, in fact, revived those conversations again. Yeah. Lovely. And I think uh, that's actually a great, uh, a great way to highlight that, you know, as long as the work is honest, uh, we keep to all our processes of reporting, documentation, and just staying transparent with our funders. Yeah. Um, as I mean, unless uh, there's, you know, some sudden shift in priorities, it's always 
a mutual relationship. Uh, funders are not looking to let go of you. And this is something I keep saying again and again, because I feel like sometimes in the minds of uh, implementing organizations, there's this big uh, barrier, you know, almost, uh, which comes from a space of, I think, very valid uh, uh, concerns and insecurity, uh, right? Which is to say, I don't know if my funder is, you know, with me. Am I just always showcasing my work? Are we truly partners? Or is this, uh, you know, a transaction I somehow have to win by showcasing my work a certain way and playing smart and so on. Um, so I think just uh, investing in that relationship and remembering humans at both ends of it is helpful sometimes as well. Absolutely, uh, Nikita. The way I see it, um, and I've mentioned this to many of my grantee partners, I don't know if they are here today, um, is to say that, you know, if both of us are trying to look at a development problem, to looking to solve a development problem, funders bring in one set of resources, which is very important. Funds are very important. But the actual work on the ground is done by our grantees, right? So acknowledging that, you know, I, I as a funder, can't solve the problem unless I have a good grantee. Uh, a grantee who is, um, you know, clear about what they're trying to do and has that credibility and has that level of trust from the community it is trying to work with. So both are important. I think funds as well as human resources and both both those actors have to come together. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I'm just looking through uh, some of the other questions received. Meanwhile, uh, Pratyush, if you see anything that I've uh, missed uh, on the chat box, do highlight it to me. Um, I think, um, yeah, one of the questions is just around a clarification question around the ground cycle at uh, MacArthur. Um, is it, uh, you know, the, what does it look like? Is it annual every three years um, when you look what, for new? What do you uh, mean by a grant cycle in the sense of the I, length of a grant? Uh, I am, again, this question is short, so I'm going to make some reasonable assumptions here. <laughs> I think it's the length of the grant. <laughs> it is, again, as I said, two to three years. Um, it depends on the project idea. Um, so if, um, you know, if, uh, if the organization thinks that to achieve a particular objective, um, you need three years, we are perfectly open to that. Um, or if two years is adequate, that's good enough for us as well. Sometimes it's the amount of money we are able to make available. So if an organization comes back to say that this is the purpose that we are looking to achieve, and uh, for this we need, let's say 500,000 US dollars, and I have at that point in time, let's say 300,000, then I say, okay, fine, rather than doing this over three years, let's now plan for two years. And we will see towards the end of two years, if we can move to the next stage of work as such. So it's also a function of the funding which is available, but typically a grant lasts anywhere between two to three years, not more than that. I mean, we haven't made five-year grants, we haven't made four-year grants. Um, the maximum that we have done is three years, yeah. Um, great. And uh, also I think uh, I see another question which is quite specific to our current context, right? Wherein organizations have had to make major pivots in their models. So um, this particular question just talks about how uh, programs that were being transacted on the ground have now, uh, you know, changed in their scope or, or are being delivered virtually, which means that uh, the impact metrics or what can be expected reasonably in the current context would also change. Um, so in, uh, you know, and in both the scenarios, one is you could be pitching a new to a funder and trying to outline how the model might look different in the current context versus later. Uh, or it could be that you're already in a partnership and uh, you know you need to kind of justify to the funder what might change, what to expect and so on. Any inputs, uh, Matushi, on how to navigate this? Because it can be tricky, right? Uh, it's such an unpredictable situation. It is and it is not because, you know, I, I'm talking about Makatha and I'm talking about other foundations in India as well. Um, I can name many other foundations who have actually proactively reached out to their grantees to check you know, how COVID has affected them. Um, and in the initial stages, we came back with 
I mean, last year we were in touch with each of our grantees to say that we understand that the lockdown is going to affect project activities. Tell us how it is affecting. Many of them came back and said, we don't know as yet. Because frankly speaking, COVID was such a showstopper in many ways, uh, in so many ways, it was new for the grantees as well. But we sort of went back to them again after three months and said that, um, you know, tell us, what do you see? And many of them have come back to request for time extensions um, to say that, you know, we could not, that these things could not be done. Some of them have taken up different strategies to achieve the project uh, purpose. So for instance, if, if there was a physical gathering which was planned under a, under a particular project as such, they moved it onto a virtual plane. Um, they've also looked at doing smaller group um, convenings rather than bringing 300, 400 people, which they could otherwise have planned, right? Um, talking with policymakers, that has happened on a virtual scale as such. So grantees have been fairly innovative themselves. They've been trying to figure out ways by which they can complete the project activities as such. And I, I would give them full credit for being really responsible with the grants that they have had to say that I am accountable for delivering the project objective I've signed up now. Except for one grant and uh, in our portfolio where we have, I mean, we heard the, uh, from the grantee to say that it is not possible to move forward on this one any longer. I mean, and I will not name the organization as that. They've all moved in different pathways and we have been much more flexible with our, with uh, in approving requests for no cost extensions in terms of looking at new sets of activities to be supported um, as such, making adjustments in under budget heads to say that fund, if what was lined up earlier now can be spent on another line item um, as such. So it has been a two-way process, but um, most foundations have found ways of um, being supportive of their grantees as such. I can't say that this has been the situation with multilateral organizations necessarily because their um, their agreements are legally binding. Mm -hmm. uh, ours are also legally binding with our legal counsels, but our, I mean, we've had a relatively more flexible approach to this um, than some of the larger organizations. So. Yeah, and it all just again comes down to communication, right? So I think... Yeah. Uh, as long as we keep that barrier in our head saying this will not fly, uh, it, it doesn't help either party. Uh, but instead to just really discuss what would be a meaningful way to solve the issue uh, is, you know, helps everybody move forward. Uh, fantastic. Um, I think uh, one question I had, Motashi, and uh, I mean, I don't see it here, but uh, has come up in the past. Aside from, uh, you know, the grant making per se, what are the ways that um, uh, organizations can look for support from the funders, right? So, uh, and funders support in different ways, right? It, it's uh, a lot of mentorship and coaching goes into helping organizations arrive at a stage that uh, they can deliver to the outcomes that are agreed on. Uh, but in your approach, what are the various ways that you support your partner organizations in ensuring that they have the right uh, approach and uh, plans in place and are thinking strategically? So it's a lot of mentoring, coaching, um, and hand-holding. We learn all the time ourselves as well. So it's when I say, um, I'm not that, you know, there is a lot of mentoring going on. It doesn't, I'm not trying to say that, you know, I have full knowledge of being able to advise my grantees on every aspect as such. But there's a lot of hand-holding support, which is um, which is always available, because uh, like the grantees, we are also very keen for the project to succeed. Um, it's very important. Um, what else? We I think one big um, two areas where I think we do much more than just grant making. One is supporting grantees in you know logging onto networks. So given where we are. Um, uh, we are in the ecosystem. We sometimes have insights to similar organizations or similar set or organizations working with similar sets of um, issues as such, um, who we can connect the grantees to. We can also connect them to maybe some other funders that, you know, and we do have those conversations to say, 
I can fund you for this, but you may want to approach ABC for the work that you want to do, but beyond the scope of our engagement. So we do a lot of um, collaborations um, in that sense. The second area I think where um, we do support our grantees is basically in terms of bringing them together on a regular basis so that they are able to share experiences, ask questions of each other, um, understand, you know, find answers um, to some of their own questions as such. So there are grantee gatherings which MacArthur supports on a, on a regular basis, maybe once a year or once in 18 months as such, where all our grantees come together. So if we are talking about, you know, supporting um, energy efficiency in the ecosystem, for instance, there are five or seven grantees working just on energy efficiency and different elements of energy efficiency. So for them to come together uh, for a two day retreat, maybe where they do have free time to connect with each other um, and discuss their issues. Uh, that's something we have seen to be a very, very, um, you know, something that grantees have really appreciated a lot. We've had several times heard from them to say that, um, you know, please continue with this gathering. It just helps us bring our questions to discuss with a group of a peer group, immediate peer group. So those are the two main things I would say over and above the handholding and the mentorship role that you talked about. Lovely. Thank you for sharing that, Mushi. Um, I also have another question from one of our cohort members, which is to ask, uh, when will trust-based philanthropy uh, happen in India? It's been seen, seen a little bit in the US, especially in COVID times. Uh, do you see it happening in India anytime soon? Very, very good question. <laughs> uh, you know, I think it depends on the, you know, what you are, uh, how you define trust. We Once we make our grants um, for Makata as such, we do leave a lot to the to our grantees to decide how that funding is actually used on the ground as such. Uh, we do not go and ask for you know line by line elements unless it is a okay that that's not a hundred percent because under U.S. laws you know we can there are different ways in which grants can be made possible and I've referred to. Generating uh, general operating support grants earlier where everything is flexible. At the other end of that spectrum are something known as expenditure responsibility uh, grants, which under um, US laws require the grantee to provide, you know, details of every line item in great detail. You know, you have to really report back on that. So you have the, the spectrum really on both ends as such. So if somebody says that, you know, there is no trust available at the expenditure responsibility end of the spectrum, that's not necessarily true. Even if I have um, trust available, I'll not be able to do it because expenditure responsibility will not allow me to do that. I do need um, you know, details because that's how the laws are defined there um, as such. Um, on the other hand, on a generating, general operating support grant, um, you know, we have you know, very little oversight of uh, you know, how the money is involved. Mostly, as I said, for uh, our organization, um, our grants are project-based, which sit in the middle between these two ends. So I would like to put in a claim to say that we are trustful, but uh, not, not probably completely to say that, you know, shut our eyes and say, okay, fine, just go on and do things um, as you think fit. Yeah. Sometimes it's not trust, it's just regulations. <laughs> so. Sometimes it's regulations. <laughs> yeah. um, and, but you know, we do start from a point of being trusting. Yeah. Uh, it is not, when we start conversations, it's not, especially the philanthropic foundations, I would say, it is not about, we don't start with assumptions to say, oh, I'm being taken for a ride. No, the, it is on a, it is on a you know belief of mutual trust. Um, I would require my grantees to trust me as I would require them to um, trust them. You know. Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. Lovely. 
So, Madhushi, I think uh, the million dollar question is that uh, for those in our audience who would like to connect with the foundation, what would you recommend uh, they do? How, how can they get in touch with your team? No, absolutely. I would, again, go back to what I said earlier, do your research, figure out if your project ideas and your organization fits in within those, you know, within the uh, priorities that are being supported in India as such. And if there are ideas and projects that you have in mind, which you, you think fit into that category, send us a mail. Uh, we will, it may take time, but we will come back to you to, you know, request a meeting. Yeah. Lovely. And uh, any last piece of advice for our fundraisers? Any thought you want to leave them with? Well, personally speaking, I think it's one of the toughest jobs. So please keep at it. Uh, <laughs> wish you all the best. Um, it is it is a tough job. I totally agree. I've been on the other side as well before MacArthur, uh, not as a fundraiser, but as a program person seeking institutional grants. Um, but and I, I think you folks really need to, you know, keep it going. I mean, have the confidence that it is it is there and you will be able to crack the puzzle. Madhushi, thank you for that note of encouragement and reassurance. Um, I really, really appreciate you spending your evening with us. I think, uh, you know, just the fact that uh, you generously and candidly answered all our questions. Uh, and uh, I think it's the authenticity that really shines through, right? Uh, uh, our intent with these conversations is to say, all right, uh, if it was just the knowledge, the information, we could all go to the websites. But uh, when funders like you come speak with us, really allow us a peek into your brains, that's super helpful in all our efforts. So thank you for spending the evening with us. Uh, and I'm sure uh, there will be a lot of people that will uh, reach out to you for guidance, advice, potential partnerships. Uh, for everybody who attended, thank you. Uh, we were very happy to have you. Thanks for your excellent questions. And uh, again, uh, for those of you who are new to ILSS, uh, do look up our website. Uh, I know that many of you are in the process of applying for our fundraising program. So we look forward to your applications. If you have any questions at all, get in touch with the team. We're happy to answer any questions. Thanks everybody, thank have you. a great evening. Thank Bye. you to you and thank you to the ILSS team and to my listeners. Thank you very much. This was good. Yeah. Thanks, Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye.